We're in Dulwich College in South London in the archives with a unique manuscript from the late 1500s. And what's so wonderful about this is it's the story of what was happening to numbers in that era and some of the changes that were happening to the way numbers are recorded and people do arithmetic. So it's really quite a historic thing. So this is Philip Henslow's diary. It's called his diary. It's more like an accounts book. Mr Fennyman, allow me to explain about the theatre business. He was the manager of the Rose Theatre, which was the neighbouring theatre to uh, Shakespeare's Globe and the rival theatre. So I want to go to this page just because it's a little clue to what's going on. Because um, until the late 1500s, everyone in England had used Roman numerals for writing. But the new number system that had come in from India to the Arab world had finally made it to England, what we might call the Indo-Arabic numerals, the modern numerals. And we can see Philip Henslow beginning to use these in the late 1500s, but not necessarily comfortable with them and also thinking some of the people who read this themselves won't necessarily know what these symbols are. He's just written the, the new numerals, 1,000, 900, 800. I'm not sure quite why he's done that, but this surely isn't the accounts of anything because it's too neat a pattern. Um, but below it, he's got a little key to say this is what it all means. So here's two sort of slightly wonky w ones, like Roman ones. That's the same as a two. A J is the same as one. Two J's equal two. This quirky little thing looks like an upside down V, but I think it's actually a V with a very long tail on it. But he's saying V is five. And then he's got this X. This is a very swirly X, which is 10. And he's forgotten. He said, 10 is 10. So he's, he should really be putting a one zero there. But his code for himself is that X equals X. He couldn't, he couldn't get his head around changing the 10. He couldn't. I can't fault his uh, algebra. X does equal X, but, um, but it doesn't really take us very far. And then over here, we've got D is 500, M is 1,000. I assume that's an L is 50. It's a strange L. And uh, C is 100. So oh, that's what these, you know, we all know the letters uh, the Roman numerals, well, this is what they turn into in the new Indo-Arabic system of numbers. So the change from imperial units to metric units happened reasonably recently in history, and it's kind of well documented how it happened and what the problems were and all this sort of stuff. Yes. We never really hear much about the transition from Roman numerals to these these numerals. Like, this is sort of giving us a little taste of that, isn't it? It, it is, and it's very similar. And you kind of, in the same way as you see today, people might say, you know, I'm six feet tall, but uh, this room is four metres wide. Like, they're both using both units in, in, interchangeably. And Philip Henslow is showing that that's what people were doing too. They were kind of, should I be using these modern Arabic numerals or Roman numerals? Or sometimes both at the same time, we'll see examples of that. And it's quite funny and charming, very human. A human side to numbers, of course. Let's go to Henry VI, I think. So, I love this page from 1591. This very hard to read squiggles. I'm sure that's beautiful handwriting. But anyway, it's saying how, what the receipts were in the theatre on each night. What you can just see here, that says NE. That stands for new. This is a new play. This, believe it or not, says Henry. Henry VI. This is a Shakespeare play for 3rd of March, 1591. Notice 1591 and the 1 has got a little dot on the top because that's a Roman one, so he's not quite sure whether to use an Arabic numeral or a Roman numeral. But he's definitely you know, 1591 in, in modern numerals. But across here, what the receipts are is that's IIJ, which is three. The last, the last one is always turned into a J so that you know it's the end of the number. That was the, the thing. So IIJ means three. Three pounds and then very hard to read squiggles, a certain number of shillings and a certain number of pennies because the system they were using, which was used in, in the UK right up till uh, 1971, I think, is pounds, shillings and pence. And it's this wonderful sort of duodecimal 12 uh, pennies in a shilling, 20 shillings in a pound. Uh, but anyway, he's recording it. That's Henry VI on its first night has made three pounds. And you're probably wondering, is that a good, is that a big number? Well, as a rule of thumb, I say multiply the numbers from those days by a thousand, so three thousand pounds. And this isn't the total receipts. Uh, it, I think they're pretty sure that these are just the receipts for the posh seats. So in addition to that, uh, the groundlings would all be coming in for a penny and there'd be hundreds and hundreds of those and they'd put their pennies into a box 
a, a little narrow slit at the end of the night, that would be dispersed all of that money to the actors. So that was their taking. And that, that box was what became the box office. So box offices date back to, to Tudor times. This was the rival theatre to the Globe that everyone associates with Shakespeare, but they're showing a Shakespeare play. Yeah, it's interesting. I think there was a degree of fluidity that they all knew each other and, you know, if there's money to be made, we'll show uh, a Shakespeare play. This is early in Shakespeare's career, so 1591. This would be one of his very first plays. So uh, I think there's rather less evidence later on of any of his plays appearing at other theatres because, of course, he had his own theatre to make money out of. But here we've got uh, a rare example. And, in fact, this particular Henry VI is sufficiently popular that three days later it's showing again and again a few... So it's not like every night for a block booking. It's a different play every night, but in this case they're recycling it four times just in this month. You said the last I was replaced by a J so that you know it's the end of the number. Isn't the fact that the number ends showing that it's the end of the number? <laughs> yeah, you'd think so. I think the idea is a bit like what one used to do with checks, where you were encouraged after you'd written a number to put a line after it so no one could come in and forge the book. So maybe it was either good practice or just a habit. But anyway, they do it very consistently, those J's. Um, just at the end of a number. So I can't come in later and add a V or something and make the number. Exactly, and make a, a non-Roman number, but yes. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's probably a bad example. What do we got here? Um, what we've got here is one of his pages that isn't all his accounts. He clearly had a sense of fun and love, you know, a bit playful. We've got, and I do you can see here, a clock face, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, then X for 10, so he's, and then 11 with two dots on it, 12. So he's all over the place with his numbers. But anyway, this is um, a card trick, which is a kind of think of a number trick as well. So it's a little conjuring trick. I think he's giving the instructions maybe for himself for how to do this trick on his mates at the pub. So, um, so there we are. He had a little sense of fun and dotted through. There are a, a, a lot of occasions where he just throws in some little random bit of everyday life that's nothing to do with uh, how much money he's made that night in the, uh, the theatre. This page is just showing, uh, well, again, we've got, we've got years typically written in Arabic numerals and then uh, amounts of money in, uh, in Roman numerals. And two things about the way the numbers are written. This 1599, 1599, look at that one and how it's got a... It's more like a seven. It's got a very long tail. It took a long time for that to disappear. So, so a very sort of scripty one. Uh, and then the nine kind of loops around. So it's often quite, quite an effort just to, to read the numbers. Likewise, for beautiful craftsmanship, look at the tens, the X, X, X. And it's all written in a single swoop of the quill, as it would be. Looks like a piece of ribbon. And I think it's mainly because you don't want to take your quill off the page and put it back on again. You're going to get blotches. So they just do these lovely, swirly... Um, X's. But it takes a while to pick out that that means 10, especially with a really long tail like, like one here that just swoops all the way around. Now, in the middle of all this other stuff is a little bit of everyday addition. So this is pounds, shillings and pence, L, S and D for pennies, denarius, 211 pounds, nine shillings and no pence, and the ones have got the little dots on top because he likes romanizing them, 188 pounds, 11 and 6. That's a little swirly 6 at the end. So when we're adding up numbers, we, um, of course, start at the right. 0 plus 6 is 6, so we've got 6 pennies. Then 9 plus 11 equals 0, 0. What's going on there? Well, because there's 20 shillings in a pound, it's actually 9 plus 11 is 20, so uh, there's no shillings left. Carry a pound across. So then we've got 1 plus 8 plus the carried 1 from the 20, confusing or what, to make another zero and we need to carry another one across, one plus eight plus one carried is zero and then carry one across, two plus one is four. So 211 plus 188 plus those shillings and pence adds up to 400 pounds, no shillings and sixpence. He's got it right, which is good. Full marks. So we just showed him getting a quite tricky addition right, which is great, but I love the fact that later in the book, on an upside down page, because he sometimes turns the book upside down. Um, anyway, he's got one, two, three, four, five. This is a multiplication. So one, two, three, four, five times one, two, three. Um, there's no multiplication sign there because it hadn't been invented yet. Um, but he knew what he was doing. 
That, those, uh, say, those don't seem like random numbers, Rob. They don't. I think he's just playing. I think he's just trying out, can I do long multiplication? So, so you've got three fives of 15, carry the one. He's not written a little carry, so he's just holding that in his head. Three fours are 12, plus one is 13, and so on. Anyway, he's worked all the way through this. He hasn't got any zeros at the end as placeholders. You don't have to have them there, but a lot of people will be looking at this thinking, oh, that's what's missing. Apart from the, the symbol, what's missing is those placeholding zeros. But anyway, alas, he's made one mistake. This should be a four. So, uh, uh, I mean, totally understandable. We, we all make mistakes and when it's a really difficult sum. But he's given himself this as a bit of practice. And of course, he hasn't got a calculator to check whether he got it right or not. Where should there be a four? Because that's eight and five, isn't it? Yeah, eight and five, but there's a carried one. Uh, ah. So 15 carried one, three, four is a 12 carried that one there. So I think there's a little one, which in modern marking would be easier to see, so it should be a four. Nobody is perfect. But it's lovely. And again, it's just so human. This is a real document from someone who wasn't planning on this being, you know, studied by scholars hundreds of years later. But, um, but he's, he's clearly a numbers guy. I mean, this is a book of numbers, a book of everyday numbers and all its flaws and all its, its beauty and elegance and just fantastic. And people tend to look at this as a sort of theatrical reference book and, 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 and how theatre was in Elizabethan and early uh, Jacobean times. And it is all of that. From a mathematician's point of view, it's just lovely to see the way people were dealing with numbers and something which we, we take for granted now, which then was a real innovation. The idea of place value and multiplication and, and arithmetic was sort of entering. And people like a theatre manager who hadn't had a great education are kind of having to learn it on the job. If you like this sort of stuff and want to find out more about Shakespeare's mathematical life and times, why not check out Rob Easterway's book, Much Ado About Numbers. I'll link to it down in the video description. And if you just like this kind of stuff, old fashioned stories about maths and science, manuscripts, pouring over all this amazing detail, then why not check out one of my other YouTube channels, it's called Objectivity. We've got hundreds of videos like this, and I think you might like them. This is one of the most juicy rows that has ever happened in the history of science. And he just sat there and calculated numbers. Yeah, so this is this kind of scribble, let's test the pen page. So uh, Philip Henzo just writing his name, making sure this quill works properly, doesn't want to block his copybook elsewhere. And um, I love this lamentable com Complaint, lamentable complaint, there we go. So just writing that is because it tests all the upstrokes and the downstrokes, so it's like the, the quirty you up or the quick brown fox of, uh, of Elizabethan times to just check out all the letters.